looks so good. And I have to say, it feels like I personally have been covering Inside Out for years at EW. So <laughs> I'm so excited that the premiere is just a couple of weeks away. And that being the case, I couldn't be more thrilled to introduce director and co-writer Peter Doctor, whose work you already know and love. He is the man behind favorite films like Up, Monsters, Inc., and Toy Story. And also joining us today as a special treat is producer Jonas Rivera. He's a longtime vet of uh, Pixar Studios, and he's worked on almost all of their Pixar movies. It's so exciting. So let's give them a welcome. Hey. Hey. Good to see you. Hi, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, everybody. This is so great. How's so who going? liked the trailer, yeah? <laughs> thank you. Whoa. Now, I have to be honest with you. I'm kind of in awe that you guys dared to go inside the mind of a little girl. Not many guys I know would be brave enough to take that on. <laughs> what inspired you to kind of dive into this story? Well, it was kind of started um, watching my daughter grow up. So my daughter, if you guys saw Up, um, she was the voice of young Ellie in the beginning of the film. And so she was actually kind of a lot like that character <laughs> when she was younger. But then she got older, she was a little more like, you know, like, uh, I'm not really... So it made me wonder, what's going on in her head? You know, what's changing in there? Um, and that's kind of what this started this movie. Wow. Yeah, I mean, it, and, and I have young daughters, and, and so Pete's kids are older, and my kids, you know, we just were inspired by watching our kids grow up and change, and thought that was a worthy question to base a movie on. Right. Plus emotions as characters, you know, they're just such tailor-made for what animation does well. Strong, opinionated, caricatured characters. Um, and they were, it was really a fun project. So how do you go from the idea of like preteen torment to creating like a full-blown story? Can you yeah. walk us through that? I mean, how do you go to your bosses and say, so I've got a story? Like, yeah. <laughs> how did you do that? Well, <laughs> it's a great I'm question. We, how much time do we have? Yeah. Well. <laughs> no, I mean, it was a very, you pitched it, uh, very beautifully, simply. Pete's just great at coming up with these ideas that feel really familiar somehow and inventive. And when you pitch it to me that way, which was something along the lines of, what if we told a story about a little girl, but she's not the main character, she's the setting. I, I kind of sat forward and, 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 and we personify her emotions and those are our characters. And we took that to John Lasseter, who's our boss, you know, who um, heads up creative at Pixar. And he did the same thing, right? You pitched it. And I remember watching him in his chair and Pete's pitching. And I saw John sit forward, kind of smile. And, uh, and, and that, that's what we want the audience to do, right? And so we thought, well, now that's a concept that everyone thought was fun. And now we have to somehow dramatize it into a motion picture. And that took three years of, what, writing, rewriting, yeah, and so Yeah, so forth. then that's us and uh, Josh Cooley, who's actually the voice of the, who's the birthday girl clown. Um, he uh, wrote on the film, and, and uh, Ronnie Del Carmen, if you don't know Ronnie, he storyboarded the, be the very beginning of Up with the sort of married life uh, sequence. Uh, he put that together. So, you know, we work with some amazingly talented people. Kevin Nolting, our, our editor, who cut it all together. We, we work, um, you guys have probably seen this, we work almost like a comic book uh, we call storyboards, and then we turn those into story reels. We film them, put our own dialogue, music, and sound effects so that we're before we actually make the film, we're kind of doing a preview of it. We can sit in a theater like this with all the other guys at Pixar and experience what the movie's going to, basically what the movie could be like. Now I have to ask, again, coming from the perspective of someone who was once an 11-year-old girl, the pictures are mortifying. I can't imagine like a movie based on my like childhood experiences. <laughs> what does your daughter think? Um, I, well, you know, she... she <laughs> What does she think? She doesn't really know how fully she was influencing the film. Okay. Because I was not talking to her, hey, I'm going to rip off your childhood and make it into a movie. Or anything so like this that. Dinner, if we could all keep movie. this in this room, yeah. that would be cool would be for Pete's family. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> I've since talked to her, and she's kind of yeah. like, you know, she saw the movie finished the other day, yeah. and she's kind of like, yeah, good movie, Dad. So oh. um, she's 16 now because it took us five years yeah. to make. So. Wow, five yeah. years. And yeah. I guess talking a little bit just about blowing this up into a big feature-length film. How did you decide to just settle on five emotions? I mean, talk to us a little bit about like creating each of these really funny but very individually different characters. Well, we did, all the movies we do at Pixar, we do a ton of research. So for cars, you know, we went and we became experts on anything automotive and for, you know, Finding Nemo, everyone got certified. And <laughs> for this movie, we're like, well, where do we even start? Uh, so we talked to neurologists, scientists, uh, psychologists, 
And um, the, the first thing was, what are emo like, what are the, what's the definition of emotions? And how many are there? And what are their function? And there was great debate, even scientifically, how many there were. One, one person we talked to said, there are 26 measurable emotions. The next person we talked to, there's three measurable emotions. Yeah. And they're like, this oh, became no. a blessing and curse. So we had to kind of right. find our way. But there was, there was five or six that kind of kept coming up, right? And it yeah. was Dr. Paul Ekman, who you had reached out to before, that helped us kind of hone in. Yeah, a lot of the basic questions, they were like, well, we don't know for sure, but the science thinks da 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 da. So that, to us, translation, we can make it up, you know, <laughs> do it wrong, which is good, because that's kind of the exciting part of the movie. But it was interesting, like, for, for me and for all of us, I had never really thought about what, why we have emotions. I mean, yeah. strangely, like, why do we have fear yeah. or anger? Like, what is it? And disgust was interesting, like, disgust. Who well, I always thought, was, thought of it as more of a reaction. But disgust is actually an embedded emotion, and it's there to prevent you from being poisoned. You'll see that we kind of wrote that oh, in the movie. Okay. Physically, like spitting out food, like, bleh, you know, like, which is like a Darwin wrote about that, yeah. that expression. And then socially, so you don't wear the wrong thing to school, maybe, and poison yourself socially. So we employed that in the writing and helped. That, that gave us a foothold, like making these characters, characters that have jobs, and they care about their job, and their job, in this case, is to protect mm -hmm. this girl. Did you guys find yourself, like, identifying with any one particular emotion? I hate to say it, but I really love disgust. I don't know what that uh, says about me, but... Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm, like, sassy, yeah. but okay. Sassy? Yeah. That's she, good. Disgust, Likes as clothes. you mentioned, she's about preventing you from being poisoned physically or socially. Uh, so, uh, you know, if you're into fashion, you know what the, the proper hairstyle and clothes and shoes and things, uh, that's, then, that's important. Well, when we called Mindy Kaling, because Mindy Kaling does a voice of disgust. Yeah, she's We great. said, we want you to play disgust. She's like, really? You want me what? to play disgust? I can almost hear her saying like, yeah. really, guys? Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> right, no, 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 no. She's no? Dis the character's disgust dead, not disgusting. She's lovely. She's like, yeah. oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. And tell me, I guess, because you have some really great comedic talent here. I mean, really Really just fantastic comedians, Amy Poehler, Bill Hader, yeah. Lewis Black. Yeah. Tell us a little bit, I mean, did you think of the characters and then reach out to these guys? Or how did that process work? And did you make the characters look like these comedians? Or Yeah, no, we wrote, <clears throat> we wrote on the film for Baby two and a half years before we reached out to them. So by that time, the characters were already designed, already built in the computer. Yeah. And what we would do, and this is what we do for all the Pixar films, is we grab little snippets of audio from other projects that these comedians or actors have been in, and we just play it while we're looking at the photo or the image of our character. And some of them, you just go like, oh yeah, totally, that's gonna, that's gonna work. So Bill Hader was the first one we cast, and yeah. um, him as Fear, he's great. Um, and, and Bill actually helped us uh, with the writing as well. So okay. we'd drag him in, we sat in Jonas's, uh, uh, a kitchen and, and sat and wrote for about a week. Yeah, we wow. weren't in the kitchen the whole time, but we we did work. My with wife Bill made for us while. leave, but we <laughs> we did work there. Yeah, wow. but then, Lewis was second, I think. Lewis uh -huh. was pretty. Okay. Lewis Black is anger, which was sort of obvious, and you even had pitched that in your initial idea when we called Lewis and said we want him to play anger. He goes, "Oh, what brilliant stretch casting guys!" <laughs> yeah. Yeah. To mock us yeah. for casting him. <laughs> yeah. Amy was the last one oh, the uh, last. for Joy. Joy was the hardest one to write, actually. Yeah. Um, really, because most people you know that are just happy all the time, you kind of want to punch them in the face, you know? Mm. Um, it's, you just don't really take that seriously. They don't seem genuine. And so we had uh, They're writing, struggle. Pete Doctor punches nice people in the face. <laughs> <laughs> if it's what's, you know, if it's, that's what it takes. Truth? Then. No, but it's true. If people uh, who are like eternally optimistic, they almost seem to rub you the wrong way. So how do you keep right. the main character like that from kind of veering towards well, the wrong direction. A couple things. In the writing, we made sure that she was always about Riley. Okay. So that she's not just like, come on, guys, be happy for no reason. It was like, we have to do this for Riley. Riley is what's the most important. So giving her an out outward goal that we can empathize with. But also, the intangible of, of having Amy. Um, we, we were pretty upfront when we talked to her. We have this issue with our main character. She's okay. Joy. Right. And she said, yeah, I think I can help you guys. Um, and it, was, it seemed pretty obvious, given what she's done on Parks and Rec and, you know, a lot of her other work, yeah. she's fantastic. Wow. So. And did she help you at all with the writing process, too? She did. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we sat with her. The first day we worked with her, we didn't record at all. We came here in New York and met with yeah. her and just wrote and just riffed on the script and went yeah. back and forth with her. And she would come up with ideas and we'd rewrite. and It was really cool. So the, at that point, you know, the, the structure of this film is already in place. Um, it was more kind of like, how would she say this? Or given this situation, can you think of anything that she would interact with this character with? And right. so, 
one thing I'm really curious about is just that the premise of a whole movie taking place in someone's mind almost seems, it seems both like there's a limit and limitless. Right. So how did you decide, A, to like keep the movie primarily in this little girl's mind, and then how did you create that universe? I mean, I think from the trailer we saw there's a couple of different like theme park like lands, right. and there's areas of production and stuff, but can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, that's a big question. I mean, that was, at the very beginning, thinking of the the concept, we were like, okay, this could be really cool. Because you're always looking to bring the audience somewhere new, right? And yet, if you go too far, then there's kind of no connection and people feel a distance. So this was an opportunity to take people into places that they've all thought about, but had never seen before. So uh, we get to introduce uh, concepts like, where did that weird dream come from? You know, or why can't I remember where I put my car keys? Or, you know, why does that song get stuck in my head? All these kind of things we get to play with in the film, which was great, um, but it was really difficult because uh, there was no, there's nothing to kind of base all this on, you know? Um, so we just started playing around. We started making a big list of kind of things that we think about in regard to the mind, like train of thought, uh, stream of consciousness, uh, brainwashing, um, dream production, where dreams are made. And so a lot of these things made it in the film, a lot of them didn't. Okay. We, did, was, we yeah. talked about design though too, just of the mind mm -hmm. and keeping it really whimsical because it, it, when, when you see the film and if you can imagine reading the script, it, it would sort of lean almost science fiction and description mm -hmm. and we didn't want that. We wanted it to be more the mind of a little girl and so we spent a lot of time with what we call headquarters, which you'll see in the movie, you know, where they work mm -hmm. and what that should look like. We actually, <laughs> sitting in here, we actually came with this thought that like it's sort of like a version of It's a Small World at Disneyland meets an Apple store. So it's sort of like part whimsy, well, there you go. part <laughs> clinical and, you know, and, yeah, and, and functional and beautiful and so forth. Design. That was, uh, that was kind of what we thought of. So there you go, Apple store. <laughs> One thing I'm really curious about, I think with Pixar movies and animation in general, that there's always a lot of fun that's being had with technology and technological advances with animation. Is there anything cool that you guys did that you can tell us that we should be like on the lookout for? Any small details? Yeah. So you can all feel really cool like that joy. we were here and we got the scoop. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, joy as a character, actually all the emotions, are made up of energy. So we wanted the characters to look the way our emotions feel to us, not made out of skin or, you know, cloth or whatever. So um, we put a lot of research into developing this uh, particles, these tiny particles that sort of move and roil. Uh, and um, you'll see, like, as anger is getting ready to explode with rage, he, his particles kind of start to get a little more uh, ramped up. So it was a, a whole new research uh, yeah. group uh, for us. Um, but they're engineered, this is kind of, I mean, sort of nerdy techie, but they're engineered that each particle is always sort of facing camera. So yeah, however we flat. shoot it, they're flat, and so they can rotate so that it, they catch light and so forth. We wanted it to look like energy, like something we'd never seen. And they're also wow. l illuminated, especially Joy, you'll yeah. see. So she, instead of casting a shadow, like all of our model, like Buzz or mm -hmm, Woody would, mm -hmm. she cast light. And so that was just an interesting inversion of our technology. Does like that how mean she's we, a vampire? No. Vampires don't cast shadows. <laughs> she is Joy. Oh, okay. She's joy. a lovely emotion. Yeah. Well, and really quick, like when you look at a frame of Joy, just like in yeah. the trailer or in one of the clips that we're gonna see, how much work does that represent? Like when you look at that, you're like, there's, Oh, I mean. <laughs> well, I mean, on average, so an anim so any shot will go through how many different departments? Layout, animation, yeah. simulation, which is like cloth, right. uh, effects, which does all the particles and any special effects stuff, lighting, rendering. So right. it goes through all those. Just taking one of them, animation, for example, animators average about four to five seconds of animation a week. Wow. So that's a, it's a, you know, it's definitely crafted frame by frame. Oof. So what's with the golden bowling balls uh, with the memories. <laughs> memories, can you, memories. Like, can you explain to us like conceptually how that kind of fit into the story? Well, we were looking for some way to represent memories. And again, we did research and the way real memories uh, work is very different than this. So we knew we were futzing things a little bit or cheating it, but um, we needed these, you'll see in the film for, for uh, story reasons, um, to represent specific memories that stay static and, and we can reference later. Um, you can see, you can kind of rewind them as Joy does, and go backwards and forwards. Um, and the super bright ones, we thought we were making this up, this idea of core memories. We had story reasons, which you'll see, uh, for needing these super important memories that kind of define who Riley is. Well, as it turns out, there's some scientific reality to that, apparently, um, that we all kind of define ourselves by a set number of core events that really define who we are. That's the way we feel about ourselves. Five, five to seven yeah. kind of things like that. So 
Um, it kind of reflects, to some degree, real life. I bet you guys didn't think you were coming here for a science lesson, right? <laughs> and that's why we like to say that's exactly 100% accurate what your mind looks like. <laughs> and that's your emotions. They were closed. That's right. All that stuff is true. Yeah. yeah. That's so funny, though. But, I mean, looking at that, what kind of stands out to you as being the most special? You know, just given that you spent five years of your life working on this movie. Well, what always gets me is uh, Michael's music. It's Michael Giacchino who did the music for Up. And we got to work with him again on this film. And uh, he's just fantastic. And it just, like, you, you work for four years or whatever, putting this whole thing together, and then Michael takes it, and somehow the music just like makes it feel like it just came down from heaven all yeah, together yeah. somehow. I don't know what other... He just uh, has that skill of, he's a great storyteller. Yeah. He just has that skill of making the tone feel right, and it just, we're very, really excited about the score. But you know, there's a lot of personal touches in these movies. Um, the voice of uh, the little kid is our story guy, Josh Cooley. He ran around with a microphone and recorded his two-year-old daughter, oh, who's wow. now, what, five or six, yeah, Lola. Yeah. So there's a lot of, like, uh, the film ends up feeling intensely personal. I noticed some gopher colors for you guys yeah, that don't yeah. know. Minnesota gophers, you're yeah. from Minnesota. Their That's colors right. are burgundy or maroon and gold. My husband's, look, he's freaking out. It, maroon, not gold, not, yeah, sorry. <laughs> oh my gosh, I just got the death oh, stare. <laughs> nearly <laughs> slipped okay. on the couch. <laughs> but yeah. tell me a little bit more about the first stuff that we're seeing there. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm from Minnesota. I, I didn't play hockey myself, but it was certainly a big deal growing up. So we needed a specific for Riley to really love and care about. And you'll see in the movie, this isn't giving away too much, what could happen? Riley's family moves to San Francisco, where there's no hockey. Like, hockey is a big thing in the Midwest, but not so much elsewhere in the world uh, or in the United States. So there's, uh, there's a lot of changes that come up. Yeah. Um, and which one of you doesn't like broccoli? <laughs> I think we both like broccoli. Yeah. I think our kids hate it. Yeah. Okay. You know, okay. So that was a, a, an easy target. Yeah. yeah. My daughter doesn't like it. <laughs> and did you ever find yourself, I guess this goes back to the trailer, but having those discussions like with your significant other where it's like you totally don't, you're not on the same wavelength and all that? Mm, like, maybe. I know <laughs> we did, uh, constantly. Yeah. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah, that was I mean, really cute. Because it's not just like the kid's mind that you're going into. It's adults right, too. Right. Right. That was the fun of the movie is like you see and you talk and there's so much thing you do, but what is actually someone thinking or what's actually going on inside their head. Yeah. That was a fun reveal to do. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay. So I think we're ready for some audience questions. Hi there. Oh, here you go. Okay. Hello. Um, so you guys done a bunch of amazing other Pixar movies. What in Inside Out are, have you brought from those movies that you've learned and that you're particularly excited and about in this movie and that you um, thought like, yes, this is going up a level in my artistic talents? Well, one thing that I loved growing up, uh, cartoons. I loved Chuck Jones cartoons and Tex Avery, the films they did at Warner Brothers and MGM. And we've always tried to get a little of that sort of looseness and fluidity in our animation. We've never really been able to pull it off until this movie. And you'll see the characters move in ways that are what, much more kind of cartoony and caricatured than anything we've done before. And that was accomplished through some technology, but also uh, Tony Ficilli, who is an amazing animator. He animated on The Iron Giant, if you guys have seen that movie. Aladdin. Uh, he's and, designed yeah. a ton of characters for characters like uh, in Incredibles. And so he would sit in dailies, which is kind of like this room. All the animators would sit here. And one person, like let's say you, showing your work, everybody else watches and scrutinizes and learns from what, what she's done. And we can propagate that knowledge around to the 40, I think we had 45 yeah, animators. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Tony then would sit and draw over those. And so you'd hit a pose somewhere, and he'd be like, you know, I think we could push this further by really stretching this or breaking the limbs in a, in a way that would be kind of physically impossible, but it's a cartoon, right? So that was really cool. Yeah, that is cool. I mean, our medium is good at characters like Buzz Lightyear, who has joints and he's plastic and he's, you know, he's, he's sort of physical. And we wanted to break that and really make it Wiley e. Coyote style, like yeah, bending, cartoon. cartoony. And so that was something we just, from working on the movies to your point, like we love that stuff and we wanted to try to find a way to plug it into Inside Out. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, hi guys, first off, congratulations on the sixth anniversary of the theatrical release of Up. Thank you, today is the day, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you. Nice. May 29th, thank you. So uh, my question was just, uh, how do you balance between the manner in which the emotions influence Riley and how Riley and her experiences influence the emotions? Good question. That was a tricky balance, and we really spent a large part of the, I'd say, three and a half years working that out. 
Um, in fact, we at one point we were all, we, we even thought like, is Riley her emotions? Like, are the five of them do they control her kind of like a giant robot or something? Mm -hmm. And we worked it out. No, kind of like us, we don't choose to feel something. We just do, right? I don't feel. I don't choose. To, you know, I think I should feel scared. Maybe. Yeah, I think I'll. No, just it just happens. happens to you. How you then act on it is up to you, right? So Riley is a self, a, her own character that these guys can love and care for, um, but. Her decisions affect the world down below. So as I keep thinking it's down below, but it's in the head. Um, so as Joy makes her way through this movie, you'll see uh, that it has concrete effects on the world, like the, the physical space. Awesome. So Thank that, that you. was tough. That's a great question. Yeah. Uh, where did the idea for the mousetrap-like contraption of the, uh, I guess, organization system for the memories come from? That came largely from, well, two things. One is we heard from a, a research uh, psychologist in Berkeley that that's actually what happens at, during the day. Your memory is stored in what you could think of as like a USB stick, kind of a temporary smaller storage space. And then as you sleep in non-REM sleep, that is now full. It's redistributed to more like the hard drive and emptied back out for tomorrow's use. And that, that explains why, like, if you stay awake for three days, it's really hard to remember anything because your, your short-term memory, short memory is kind of full. So we kind of thought, well, we could represent that in the film. And then the actual physical nature of it was um, off of um, a lot of kinetic ball sculpture. Like, I don't know if you know the work of George Rhodes as a sculptor who's done a lot of, like, boing, you know, movements and things with cue balls. I think there used to be one in the, um, here in New York in... Uh, well, anyway, um, there's, if you look them up online, George Rhodes with R-H-O-D-E-S, I think it is. They're really cool. Um, and we, didn't, we looked at a lot of other guys, too, that do kind of ball sculptures um, to try but to make really it fun. But that really made it feel whimsical. Like, it, so it was functional based on research, but it also started to make it feel like a kid's mind somehow. Yeah, exactly. like it just felt like the right tone. It wasn't too clinical. I just kind of had more of a question on the technology behind animation. It seems like it changes so drastically from, from year to year, especially when you look past five or 10 years. What can we expect to see that there'll be more drastic changes in, in the animation in the next couple of years? That's a really good question. I mean, a lot of, to some extent, I mean, the creative drives that. So we have a, we have a group at Pixar, so a group of computer scientists, the tools group, and they will create tools and try to, try to anticipate the needs of what the stories will be. For example, when we did the movie Brave, obviously just in the very early concepts, it was clear that this was gonna be really tricky for costumes and hair. You know, Merida had this beautiful long hair, and so we spent a lot of upfront time developing simulation tools and, and, and ways for the animators to animate you know, the, the, the hair and the cloth. On this film, um, it was interesting. There was less of a, of a new, unique tool set and more of a way we had to like reinterpret the tools to get caricature and design and light and different things. So we sort of inverted the tool set and put it on its head. It's hard to say where it will go in the next 10 years. What tends to happen at Pixar is uh, we spend a whole bunch of energy improving things for efficiency and then the creative uh, desire kind of eats those gains almost instantly, yeah. you know, in terms of like render power. For example, I mean the render farm we call it at Pixar has exponentially what? Quadrupled since Toy Story many times over and it, yet it still takes 15 hours to render one frame of film, yeah. and, and that's that mean, yeah, we, we just go, adding, oh boy, we can do this now. Know, we keep adding stuff. I think for us, everything is about storytelling, so we don't really sit in, in the story room and think about like what we're gonna need. We just think of like, what do we want? How do we, and what do we need visually to tell this story? And then the studio, uh, it really kind of steps go, into that. Go, technology elves, well, go make. <laughs> John Lasseter bring so, us said uh, early, early on, on at Pixar, it's a place where the art is meant to challenge the technology, but the technology is meant to inspire the art. So we get this kind of feedback cycle of, right. of, of those two things colliding, and that, that helps guide our way. But everything we do, I mean, Pete and I love like hand-drawn animation, and the fact that these movies are made in the computer, but by people, handmade. So we always look for things that, I don't know, blur that line, I suppose. That's where we try to push it. Well, we have such talented, amazing people. I was sort of joking about the technology elves. I mean, there are are just brilliant people who can kind of do anything. Right. So, um, yeah, it's, it's really about where, where the stories take us. Hey, how's it going, guys? Good, um, thank you. Just something I was wondering about the actual characters of the emotions. Can they feel different emotions? Like, can the, the character of Joy ever feel anger? 
Absolutely. Which is, of course, not real. But then again, we don't really have little people in our heads. Because who would be in their yeah. heads? You know? So Stop. It just, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so yeah, we, we thought of them as characters um, with more of a full range of emotions just so that they become more interesting and dynamic. Joy is really, I mean, it's her movie, as you'll see. She's got the arc, and we kind of pay most attention to her. Um, but um, yeah, anything else to add? No, I think that was the fun of it, though, that, that we wanted them to be very clear, almost like our version of the Seven Dwarfs. You're like, anger, that's anger. But they're all in service. They're working to our little girl named Riley, as you saw. and so. They, they do emote other things. They do feel other things, even if, it's, even if it's small. I mean, Bill Hader is really funny with fear, for example. I, I love this idea that uh, he put forth that he should almost come in to work like the opposite of fear, like I'm not going to be afraid today. <laughs> and then immediately he erodes yeah. into fear. So even that was fun to play yeah. with. So we wanted them to have multi, multi facets. Um, I'm kind of just curious to you, see this film kind of inspiring any like you know real life theme park attractions because that's one thing that i love about like disney is that I, and pixar everything kind of overlaps you are speaking our language yeah. <laughs> we love the theme parks we we're big disneyland fans yeah, how long did it take after pitching this idea before we started talking about theme parks honestly like 45 minutes after he pitches i'm like this should be an epcot yeah. Oh. This could be a, this could that's be my awesome. thought too. So we literally wrote like the, the Imagineers like, we have one for you and we've been working, we hope so. Yeah. I mean, I don't know, all of our films, we, we love the fact that the, the Pixar films have sort of found a place, you know, Cars Land and, and the characters and Buzz and Woody and stuff. And so we thought this felt kind of like a, it's a world and you get to go places. So we hope so. Stay tuned. Yeah. We're going to keep trying. Kind of riffing off of that, though, do you see this film kind of spawning off an entire franchise, or do you think it's more of a standalone, maybe like up? I don't know. We don't really two? think that way. It's a good yeah. question. I mean, it's certainly, it's certainly a world that we love, and it's a big idea, I think, where you can kind of go into people's heads. But we, I don't know, we t coming off of up, we thought of, like, what do we want to do next that's totally different? And being that it's six years ago, literally today, we're kind of feeling that, like at least right now, like let's do something totally new and different. Yeah. <laughs> at least that's how, and it may be that you have to understand we spent five years in this world and with these characters, and part of it is like we love them, but let's, let's change it up a bit. Yeah. So hard to say, but that's kind of where we lean. Yeah. Cool. So um, with that, we'll leave you. Yeah, thank you all so much for yeah. coming. Thanks, and for thanks coming Apple out Store, tonight. for having us. Yeah. Thank you.